doing today? Hallelujah. Praise God. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. We are excited you're here with us today at Lakeshore Assembly of God. We have a special uh, just moment to be with Jesus this morning. I want to embrace that in a powerful way to recognize not just what he's accomplished for us, but how he's doing that and who he is in our lives. Father, just come in power and in might. Reveal to us your Holy Spirit's plan, not our plan, not the church's plan, but the vision of you, Lord Jesus. Give us a vision to stand on, to walk in, to replace our vision with, and give us a heart to sing with Holy Spirit energy. Empower us. Fill us up, O Lord. Fill us up, O Holy Spirit. Give us strength. Give us power. And give us a mind and heart to worship you with everything we have. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those who can stand, would you please stand for worship? morning we give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, we invite you in, into the service and into our lives more fully. Lord, just fill us up to overflowing in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. Here you 
beginning to the end. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Christ who lives within me. From the beginning to the end, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. You are God. You're the great I am. Breath of life, I breathe you in. Even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are strong in my brokenness. Sovereign over every step. Even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are God. You're the great I am. Breath of life, I breathe you in. Praise God. Wow. <laughs> Man, you can tell she's been working on that one. Praise the Lord. Amen. In the Old Testament, the shofar was sounded to call the people. There was a lot of things they did with those horns. That was before the internet. Okay. Amen. So the horns often were how they communicated to the community. But they called people to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. They called people to worship a holy and a living God. And that's what we are here to do today. We're going to anoint with oil in Jesus' name. I'd like to ask uh, um, some to come forward at this time uh, to be anointed with oil. And uh, praise God as soon as um, my brother's done praying, he can help anoint oil as well. Hallelujah. And we just give God the praise. Yeah, John, if you want to help out and Sandra, thank you. Thank you. Praise God. And uh, I'd like the TC guys to come up and stand, get a line straight across here. We want to have a prayer line with the TC guys. Anyone who wants to remain up here and be prayed for, move over to my right right here. Face forward and we'll, we'll pray with you. And um, um, praise God, come at this time. Anoint you in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Jealous for me, love like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh Verse 1, he is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy, when all of a 
a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us Lord we give you glory and honor thank you Lord for all the things you do for us each and every day Lord there is no one like you you loved us so much Lord how can we repay that it could take a million years and would still never be repaid but Lord we love you because we know you love us we thank you, Lord, for all the things you've done. In Jesus' name.
standing awe of a God whose heart was ravished over fallen man. Washed in the power of innocent blood, it's covering all of my sin. And I come, and I come. You consider me lovely, let this true open up my soul. Enter into your dwelling place, I hear you now, I open the door. You come and you come and you come and you come. come.
Spirit comes, He begins to melt away those things which occupy our heart and our mind more than our faith does. And in the story of the prodigal son, he only had to get as far as the property line. 
He didn't have to be perfect. All he had to do was turn around. And many of us need to turn around today. And I'm going to tell you that the enemy is going to try and take this moment from you and occupy your heart and your mind with the things outside of the walls of this sanctuary and this church. But I rebuke that in Jesus' name. And I, I bring forth the presence of the Holy Spirit and I seek His presence in this place for you today. So Lord, come, O Holy Spirit, come and flood and fill this environment and this atmosphere that we may walk and talk with you, that we may know you and grow in you, that we may receive you and believe you, that when you say you are for us, who can be against us? In Jesus' name. I lift up every need. I lift up every doubt. I, I lift up everything that has acted as an obstacle or a hurdle in the lives of you today. In Jesus' name, I rebuke them in Jesus' name. And I, I just ask the Holy Spirit to fall fresh on you this morning in Jesus' name. As we go into this final song, if you feel that you've needed to be prayed for but you haven't come up yet, I invite you to come up at this time. And if you have the strength, I ask that you raise your hands as a sign of submission to what Jesus has for you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Give them glory. Hallelujah. We praise your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you in these last days, God. Lord, that as the, the world is just, we can't blame the world. They're just being what they are. But God, you're calling the church to be what it's meant to be. So God, we thank you, Lord, that you are always, you are always the fellowship in the storm. You are always, God, the, the one that's above it all. Hallelujah. You've always been. You always will be. And Lord, you will always have the last word. All the shouting and all the screaming that's going on in our culture, it doesn't matter. A whisper by the Holy Spirit is more powerful than a billion voices on this earth screaming at the same time. There is no comparison to your presence, to, to, to the folly of this world. So God, we thank you and praise you. I've read the back of the book and I find out, Lord, that you win. Hallelujah. Amen. And God, I give you the praise. I give you the glory that in these last days, God, you are equipping us. You are blessing us. You are helping us. You're redeeming us. You're casting mantles upon us, Father. You're placing empowerment. Father, you're placing callings. Father, you're, 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 you're taking people even of, of different times in their life, Lord, and you're recapturing things, Lord, that you spoke prophetically to them 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they're coming to pass. And God, we give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Do you have a word? As, as I was praying today, I was reminded, the Lord reminded me, um, when I give a word, I, I don't usually say, thus saith the Lord, because, you know, the Lord wants us to judge for ourselves. But the Lord seemed to speak to me of how I was this week. The sun was shining so bright and I had my sunglasses on, and it was wonderful. But then I went inside, and I still had my sunglasses on, and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't see. And um, have you ever been after your shower where you can't hear or you go down the, the road? We had that happen this week where our, our ears were blocked. We didn't even know they were blocked. And I believe that there may be people here that they have been deafened and they have been blinded, not totally blind, not totally deaf, but just to the point where they're not seeing what God wants to do in their lives and the answers that God has for us. And I just pray a blessing and a, an, an exhortation over each one of us today that we would take our sunglasses off, that spiritual sunglasses, that we would open our ears so we can hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us today. Good word. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to have a special presentation here in a minute. Uh, first, I have the sign-up sheets for the Light for the Lost Banquet. Guys, this Thursday is the Light for the Lost Banquet. It's a missions fundraiser. How many have ever been to a Light for the Lost Banquet before? Wow, a lot of you. Okay, how many have never been to one before? Never been to a Light for the Lost Banquet? Cool. This Thursday's your day. Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to have a blast. It's a uh, buffet dinner at 6 p.m. We'll be opening the food line. And at the same time, the northeast area of the Assemblies of God is going to have our, we're going to have our brouhaha in the sanctuary here with all the pastors from the northeast section. We're going to be voting on some stuff for just 15, 20 minutes. And then they'll be coming in as well. So we're going to have many people here from many other churches. It's going to be a blast. So I'm going to ask the members of our church, be conscious of that. And especially when you sit in the fellowship hall, try to sit next to someone closest to the wall. Keep as much uh, seat area open so when people come a little later, they have somewhere to sit. So keep your eye on that. Have that hospitality going. Also, thank you, everybody, that helped. I've been uh, real sick this week, so um, you're going to hear a good sermon today. I'm not preaching. Hallelujah. Uh, Brother Mike's going to be speaking today. And... Uh, uh, I had a real bad, bad sore, uh, throat thing this last few days, and, and I'm thrilled I feel this good today to even be here. Hallelujah. And uh, um, But thank you all for helping at the... I want to ask, how many, if you helped at the VBS outreach, how many helped at the VBS outreach? Stand up. Okay? Stand up if you helped at the VBS. 
How many helped with the... Well, not yet. Not yet. No. No. Don't clap before it's time. Amen. How many helped in any way, shape, or form with the clothing ministry outreach this year? All right. Stand up or raise your hand. Stand up or raise your hand. If you're able to stand, good. If not, raise your hand. Okay. You helped. How many helped with the car show outreaches this year? Stand up. The rest of you. Okay. Praise. You helped at the car shows. Helped at the car shows. Okay, stand up. Yeah, good. All right, let's give a praise for this amazing outreach staff. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And there's many that help that are not here this morning. Some are away. Others are sick. And so let's keep those in prayer. Also, the Teen Challenge guys are here this morning. Let's give God a praise for them. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I understand they're going to be here for a few weeks in a row, huh? Oh, man. This is going to be fun. Amen. We love these guys. And uh, we may not let you leave. You know, we got enough rooms here. We could, we could take you hostage, man. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Amen. Oh, sh but they eat every day. Oh, man. I don't know. Okay. Amen. Praise God. So it's anyhow, the buffet this Thursday is $5. All you can eat chicken buffet. And men, men in the... The men in the church, we're going to have the envelopes all over the ones that we use at the men's group because you don't even need to fill out a, a pledge card for the coming year. Uh, if you have money you're going to put in it, just put it in there because our pledge uh, for the men's group is a sizable, sizable amount. So we won't even need you to fill out your pledge cards. Uh, at, but if you give this Thursday, definitely put it in that envelope so it's it's counted for our men's group, praise the Lord, because we give, uh, praise God, I'm so proud of the men here, the, the, we give a lot of money to Light for the Lost, and uh, man, Lord has blessed us, Lord has blessed us, and praise God, well at this time, Dave, Dave Dye, would you come on up at this time, we're going to have a special presentation here. First Timothy 1.12 says this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength and that he considered me trustworthy and appointed me to his service. Now, many years ago, uh, remember when the duck things was the thing in your house? How many have those stupid duck things around the top of the edge of your You guys don't remember? I remember everywhere I went, there was duck things and whatever. What, what, did, you call, what, what did you call that, that, that border thing that you did around the top of the... Yeah, border. Okay. Well, la ladies put ducks and flowers. I put pictures of cars, okay? So our bathroom downstairs was called the race room. Because when you went in, all the way around were pictures of race cars. And I had a picture 30-something years ago, had to be 30-something years ago, of this, this yellow Ford Falcon. And on the side, it said, running for the prize on it. And I thought, man, whoever owns that car has got to be a Christian. Because that's a Bible verse. And I always wondered who it was. Well, it took many years, but I found out who it was. And it was this man right here. Dave, come on, stand up here. <clears throat> Amen. And the Lord brought Dave here years ago, and Dave and I have a, almost a, we have a parallel vision to reach the racing community for Christ. Dave's different in that he's, he's actually a real racer, and he's been out at the tracks for, uh, what, 30 years now, right? Almost 40 years. And there's nobody out there he doesn't know, there's nobody out there that he doesn't love. And uh, anyhow, but I had that picture on the wall, and Dave has had a vision to reach racers. So there's another scripture in 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So everybody has something different. Dave has had the gift of loving and having compassion for the men and the women at, at especially Cooley Motorsports, used to be Thompson. And uh, this morning, um, I'm going to give him 
a church ministry credential, and he is going to be officially a drag racing chaplain out at the track. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm going to let Dave testify for a few minutes, and then we're going to pray and uh, just ask the Lord to, to bless the labor of love, because we believe that we are going to enter into a time, we've been talking about this, a time of harvest. We planted a lot of seeds. We, we got to sharpen the sickles. Amen? Go ahead. Amen. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Um, first, I'd like to say I, I feel real bad. My wife was not able to be here. Uh, she's got exactly the same thing a pastor had. I can't even, when she talks, nothing's coming out. <laughs> And she really, really wanted to be here today, but she couldn't. Uh, I'm going to do this as quick as I can. Uh, Forty years ago this summer, Joan and I graduated from the Church of God Ministerial Internship Program. I was 27. Uh, I can't even think back that far, hardly. Uh, we were active. But we never, it, it, the, the funny thing was, right after that, it seems like we got cast out into some kind of crazy spiritual desert. Even though we were in uh, Church of God in Garfield for 20 years, we were active. We were, I was teaching. I was busy at Euclid Church of God. I was busy, busy. Uh, but I was never able to break through into the calling that God had for us. And uh, it got so discouraging, and I started getting bitter. And uh, little did I know that it was God's way of uh, pulling the feathers out of the nest and getting me to fly. And uh, I went way out of my comfort zone. And trust me when I say this, uh, I said, the heck with it. And I didn't say the heck with God, and I didn't say the heck with ministry. I said, the heck with what's going on. I'm going to change it up. And then I said, I'm going racing, and I'm going to surround myself with as many people that I didn't know. Well, at that point, I didn't know anybody, uh, and I have been doing that ever since. But my goal was to be a light to them because I realized that I might be the only Bible they'll ever read. Uh, Scripturally, uh, being a Bible teacher for many years, I understand now, <laughs> I really see it now, the 40-year thing. Uh, I'm not the person I was when I was 27. Uh, and I thought about the 12 spies that went into the promised land. Ten of them came back with a bad report. I wouldn't want to have been no 10 spies. But there were two spies that said, yes, we can take the land. It's a land of plenty. One of them was Joshua. Another one was Caleb. And God had plans for Joshua. He was going to lead. And here's Caleb. He's now 80 years old. In today's life, uh, my father-in-law, well, he defies description. He was putting roofs on in his 80s. Um, he's still alive, you know, World War II vet, you know. I, but Caleb, after the rest of the spies, everybody, that generation had passed. When he entered, he got to enter the promised land. And he said, give me that mountain. And I'm looking now at this ministry that, that all of a sudden came out of nowhere, uh, Two of my greatest requests that Joan and I had were answered within days of each other. This is one. Another one was from my son, and he just happens to be 40. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, this mountain that I'm looking at, I, I talked to Pastor a couple of years ago, and I said, you know what? I said, I've been planting a lot of seeds just in friendship evangelism. That's what I was doing, friendship evangelism. That is... We're doing it, and you don't even, this church is doing it, doesn't even realize sometimes how important that is. But I felt the urge. I said, we got to start pushing the envelope, or I did. I had to start pushing the envelope. And uh, I was still, still able to race. 
And I lettered the car up, Lakeshore Assembly Motorsports. So you can't miss it. See it a mile away. And all of a sudden, I noticed that it, some walls were being knocked down spiritually. I could feel it. And all of a sudden, I was having more liberty to speak. And now pastors sharing the very same thing that I'm feeling. We as a church have been planting seeds for a very, very long time in our auto car ministry. We're doing the car ministry. Why? To gain friendships, to build friendships. And then you build off of that. Why? Because we have earned their trust. And now we have the opportunity. I feel it. Next year, we're going to start pushing it a little more. Pastor, you've been doing it. You've been stepping out there. And if, if people don't want to hear it, they're going to leave. And we cannot stop that. But there's enough people out there that want to hear it, that need to hear it, that have to hear it. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I, I got to be honest, in a, in there are some of us as, as Christians, we can live our whole lives healthy. There are sometimes, some Christians we go through areas, we struggle in health here and there a little bit. Then there's some people that struggle most of their life. Well, I've struggled since I've been 18. Uh, I am not an optimist nor a realist. I am, a, or an, I am not an optimist or a pessimist. I'm a realist, but I am a man of faith. I have already beat death to my knowledge, to my knowledge. This doesn't count the times when I was 17, before I was a Christian, going out drinking every Friday night and defying death. Many, you know, I was overworking a lot of angels. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've already beat death to my knowledge three times. And this last three years have been very difficult, but... Uh, after being on painkillers for 11 years, I walked away, and uh, it wasn't easy because I did it right after I had a heart attack and then a stroke, and uh, I just piled it all in at once. For five months, I did nothing, and uh, I woke up morning and I said, God, not another day. I said, I can't deal with this, and uh, the Lord said, I'll never forget this day. I was, I felt like I was seven, he was talking to me as if he were 17, which was the last year I actually felt well, and he goes, I want you to get out of bed, which I was going to do that, he said, I want you to put your pants on, there's, that'll preach by the way, because all I did was have pajamas on, now we're in April now, and uh, he goes, put your pants on, and then he told me something that, that shook me to my core, he said, face the pain. And uh, when I did that, my recovery started. And now it's been two years that I've not taken, you know, any, any pill, uh, any of that stuff. And uh, I'm doing greatly better because of that. But I, unfortunately, the stroke sapped a lot of my, it just... In case you're wondering, this is free. This one don't cost you nothing. I remember hearing people preach that. I got to say it. The reason my hair is like this, if anybody had known you, if known me any length of time, you see this? This is the way what my hair used to look like on my head. This is so wiry I could sell it to the government, okay? They could use it in the military. <laughs> now look at this. Stroke did shut, shut a switch off or turn something on, and it got straight. So I am from that generation, so I am letting my hair grow a little bit. I'm just, that's, just so you know. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. They did find something when they did the MRI after the stroke, and I was having another problem. Seemingly overnight, I lost the ability to teach. I lost the ability to preach, at least the way I knew. And I uh, lost the ability to play bass. I haven't given up on a bass, by the way. Well, you know that. Uh, music means a great deal to me. But the funny thing was, I thought, I, I'm done. I can't, I, I can't do anything else. But my heart still burned. 
it's burning now more than ever. And uh, so the Lord has reinvented the way I preach. Uh, notes mean nothing to me. Um, I, if I had this, I would just... It, it, it's all coming from here. I can't teach anymore, no. It's, but preaching is a little different. Because i got 47 plus years now of testimony. Not only from what God's done for me, but from my wife, from my son, from my friends. And... Uh, Pastor, we're going to build, we're not going to build, we're going to start seeing spiritual, I'm claiming this right now. Just call that claiming thing, well this is what I'm claiming. I am claiming souls from all the work that you have done over the years and this church has done. Um, I am, it's amazing, I am so perfectly fitted for this ministry, it scares me. You know, but the thing is, I have no idea what's ahead. And that's a God thing when you don't know what's ahead. Because you have to trust God. Amen? Yes. So this coming, it's all going to start. We have our banquet coming up. And uh, we're slowly, but uh, discreetly, we are going to slowly start more gospel. More gospel. Planting more seeds. And we are going to start seeing, and, 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 and Mark, where, where's Mark? Way in the back. Mark, you you... I believe you were the one that, that, that when he called you and he says, I want to talk to the race. What was it? The race car pastor? Was that it? God, I love that. That is so good. Uh, but you know, because you had something in common and you knew that you, there was enough there you can trust. And that's what we're going to do. And I'll shut up. Here you go, Pastor. All right, Stay right there, bro. Amen. We're going to come on over here. We're going to pray. Praise God. Hallelujah. And uh, praise God. So let's pray. Father, we want to thank you and praise you. God, when my brother said he still has the fire. And God, fire is energy. And God, you got to do something with fire. It, fire can destroy or you can put it in a box and heat the, heat the house. So, Father, we pray, God, that that fire that, that is in my brother, it's something that has not waned as the years have gone by. It's something that has increased. And, Father, you have, you have saved him. You've prepared him for this very day. So, God, we look forward to see what you're going to do in our lives. Father, I ask for a touch physically of my brother. God, that you give him and sustain him in spite of himself. <laughs> Many of us here, in spite of ourselves, Lord. May we go forward and, and continue and complete the task that lies ahead. So, Father, it's with great honor, Lord, that, that, that we, we just honor our brother this morning. But we give you the praise. That card in a wallet is one thing, but the fire in his heart, that's all that matters. Yes. Yes. So, God, we thank you and praise you, God, that something that you started many, many years ago. Lord, we, we, just, we are excited because God, it's almost like old furniture. You, you get rid of it, you get something new, and then after a while, that stuff's antique, and it's worth 10 times more than the new stuff you got. So God, use my brother in a way, Lord, that he can't even comprehend. And the hundreds of true friendships. I've, I've talked to guys at the track. They, they have this unbelievable trust and respect for Dave. And Father, we thank you for the souls that we're going to see garnered into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name, we pray and agree. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God, bro. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. Well, Mike's going to preach this morning. So I'll get the mic up here. starting my ministry that brother Dave came up to me and he said Mike any help you need I want to be there for you and the first thing I realized about Dave is the difference between a race car driver and a Christian who drives fast is the race car driver tends to be thinking about racing during service Dave brings the service to the racetrack God is good. He's blessed him abundantly, and I've been blessed by Brother Dave many times. 
This is an exciting moment. It's a great morning to be a child of God in rock-solid relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to start by reminding all of us that, as you know, it's become increasingly difficult to discern current events with all the swirling points of media and the narratives they peddle. It's growing in their audience, but the truth is out. Even Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Can we know truth while talking about the Bible and today's issues? Well, I'm excited to announce that coming up in five weeks, we have a special six-week initiative that we're rolling out in Sunday School. We're going to tackle today's issues with the Word of God. The timeless truth of God's Word, the Bible, the only perfect thing on this earth that's alive, so when you read it, it reads you. And that's why I'm happy to announce beginning Sunday, October 22nd, we will be taking up issues like these. The sanctity of human life, October 22nd. Pornography is destructive. The Bible on homosexuality. Discerning messages of media. Using technology wisely. And the Bible on the environment. Friends, we know some stuff about God's Word here at Lakeshore Assembly of God, let me tell you. We know God's Word is not silent on today's most controversial issues, as Paul instructed Timothy. All Scripture is by the inspiration of God and is profitable for the doctrine and teaching. 2 Timothy 3.16 We also know God's Word is quick and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 tells us we know that God's Word is the answer. What we don't know is how. How do we share it? How do we apply biblical principles to the complex challenges facing our families and friends, our communities and churches right now? How do we uphold Scripture and speak the truth in love? Um, and how do we engage culture when our society is running headlong in the opposite direction? Well, Jesus promised in John 16, 13, that he, the spirit of truth, has come and is come and he will guide you into all truth. Hallelujah. So these six lessons are designed to equip you on how to answer difficult questions using biblical truth. Learning how to engage today's issues from the Bible can be exciting. And that's why I need your help. We have five weeks until this series begins October 22nd, all right? And I need you to pray about which of these classes you believe you or someone else can benefit from and grow from and learn from. And then I want you to share these classes and their dates, which are posted in the lobby, as the Holy Spirit guides you, amen? I'm sick and tired of the media getting things wrong. I'm grateful God never does. This initiative begins October 22nd. David Wells has observed that it's very easy to build churches in which seekers congregate, but it's very difficult to find a church in which biblical discipleship is harnessed. We need to mature into genuine disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, good morning. That's my pitch for Sunday school. Good morning. Welcome to Lakeshore Assembly of God, where everyone is someone in Jesus is Lord. Lord, give me strength to share your word as you instruct this morning in Jesus' name. As we were joined in praise and worship together today, I was reminded of a young minister who he had been appointed to his first church in a small town, and as he settled into his appointment, he met his congregants and townspeople, and he was warned about a man named Bert Onley. He was a town skeptic, and Onley believed not only was it his duty, but his responsibility to make every pastor look like a fool. Onley was always looking for holes to jump into and break down the complex arguments that pastors might stand on. As, Bert, as expected, Bert Onley came to the young minister's first worship service, and afterwards he couldn't wait to run up to the pastor and say to him, you know, you did a good job, but I don't believe in the infallibility of God's word. The young minister calmly replied, 
It is appointed once for a man to die, and then the judgment. A confused, oddly, hastily restored it. As a skeptic, I can prove to you there's no such thing as judgment after death. The young pastor said, For it is appointed unto a man once to die, but after this, the judgment. But that's no argument, Onley protested. We need to get down to the business of debate with real arguments. The pastor shook his head, no. I am a deliverer of God's word. I'm not here to argue over it. Onley now annoyed and grumbled, don't you have anything meaningful to say? I do. It is appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment. As Onley walked home, he later stated it seemed like even the frogs began to croak. Judgment is near. Judgment is near. Judgment. The next morning, the skeptic returned to the church. I've come to see you about the verse you gave me last night. The young minister's scripture had burned its way into Onley's mind in a way that the theological arguments for theism never could. Clouds that once rained skepticism down and flooded Onley's mind with cynicism had begun to part, allowing the simplicity of relationship with Jesus to come center stage in his storm-ravaged life. The skeptic had removed his robe of skepticism and allowed Jesus to wash it in the blood shed for us. When Onley got it back in return, it was a crimson-colored, purpose-providing robe. When Onley left the church that afternoon, his sandy foundation of skepticism was replaced with the immortal, immortal immovable bedrock of God's truth. Now Onley was ready to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you? This morning. Let's talk about it. My day starts with thanking God in Jesus' name for the simplicity of a life surrendered in Jesus' name. Jesus is the highest name. He is above every name, on the earth and under the earth, Philippians 2, 9 and 10. It is known that if everything Jesus did was captured in print, even the world itself could not contain the books that ought to be written. Picture that. If you miss a parable of Jesus, you miss a lot. Today we're going to be looking at the parable of two builders. One whom was way off base and the other who dug in deep and got the big picture. In the end, these two builders experienced the same obstacles, the same hurdles. And the picture shows what separates these two builders is who Jesus is to each of them. If you miss the contrasts between these two builders, you will forfeit how a simple choice can weight down, shut down, and eventually power down your kingdom-purposed future. As we read, you're going to see that one builder knew Jesus for what he accomplished and how that could help him. You're also going to see what the other builder knew was who Jesus was and how knowing that could help him live a life robed in the purpose-driven life for Christ. Amen. In a one-sentence summary, these two builders who represent all people explore the truth that when it comes to Jesus, it's all about relationship and not all about what you can get. Let's see what the Bible has to say about the two builders who put it all on the line. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Today we're looking at the synoptic gospel of Matthew. Now, Matthew's original readers were the Jews, so Matthew's focus is primarily on Jesus being the Messiah as he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. And as you're turning there, it's helpful to know this because while Matthew appears first in the New Testament, it was actually written after Mark and same with Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke can be studied synoptically or comparatively while the gospel of John is completely different from the synoptics in form and function. Still, all four Gospels present the life and teachings of Jesus. Each book, however, focuses on a different or unique quality of Jesus Christ. All right, Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. 
This is a picture of simplicity of relationship with Jesus. Verse 24 tells us, The first builder was a wise man. He built his house on a rock which provided a solid foundation. Throughout the Bible, we learn God is our rock. Psalm 28.1, the Lord is our rock. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will take those who go down to I will be like those who go down to the pit. Psalm 62, verse 2, and then 6 and 7. God is our only sure rock. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Jesus gives us a straightforward parable here. The first builder chose to construct his life's work upon the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The first builder saw who Jesus was, and saw him as the rock to anchor into, and knowing how that could help him live a life clothed with purpose in Jesus Christ. Because the first builder chose wisely when the first storm pounded against the structures of his life, his house stood firm. All right, Matthew 7, 26 through 27. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. And it, fall, it fell, and its fall was great. So the foolish man represents those who build a life on sand. The foolish man heard the word of God, but ignored it. The foolish man knew what Jesus was about, but he knew what he was about too. So the foolish man built his life on something else. The sand represents any and all of life's foundations that are divorced from the supremacy of God's word. This is very common amongst American Christians, as you need to watch out for this today more than ever before. The days have arrived and are now here that you absolutely will see Christians who profess the name and deity of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they will not live a life clothed in the purpose of Jesus' reasons, but on a foundation of their own making and their own strength and their own design. Some choose to build the foundation on wealth. Some choose to build the foundation on pleasure. Some choose to build the foundation on the approval of bosses or people. And others just want a shortcut. The simple truth of this parable is so easy to understand, but it is so hard to live. Stand on the stone or sink in the sand. Hallelujah. I bank a brisk iced tea that the life of the sandy builder looked far more extravagant compared to the life of the rocky builder. Yet it was the foolish man's house that collapsed in the storm. Where are you building your foundation in these final days? Realize the devastating storms, devastating storms were the same. The same rains descended and the same floods came. The same winds blew and both houses were beaten down. Yet one life stood firm and one life fell into utter and complete ruin. How will the foundation of your life hold up when the storm comes? Listen, the brute fact is this simple. Your purpose in Christ is at stake if you build your life into the wrong foundation. My grandfather grew up in eastern Pennsylvania, and every year he looked forward to his family's annual trip to New York City. He loved the skyscrapers and the free entertainment on the subway system and just the hustle and the bustle of the city. It all thrilled him. At 16, I was able to join my grandfather at the Big Apple and I enjoyed every single part of the trip except the incessant banging that was happening on every other street corner. Well, it turns out that New York City is built on slab after slab of granite rock. And 
If you're going to build a tall tower on granite rock, you need to take that pylon and you need to go deep. The taller the building, the deeper the pylon. And it turns out it's hard building stuff the right way, which means it's going to cost the builders a lot of times more than they anticipate. And so at times they will skimp on the depth of how far they put that foundation. They take a shortcut. The pilings go in, down, the building goes up. And within a few years, the foundation begins to rot and sink. So the stairs don't line up, the windows wedge shut, the doors are sealed closed. And the weight of that tower collapses the faulty foundation of that foolish builder. To fix the foolish builder's shortcut, a master builder has to be brought in to re-examine that foundation, check those corners, seal those openings, jack that building up, and re-drill the pilings into the granite the right way. It winds up costing the foolish builder more in the long run to re-establish the foundation he built wrong in the first place. But if he doesn't fix it, the entire tower will have to come down and he will lose everything. How long has it been, friends, since you have examined the foundation of your life? Do you need to rebuild the corner? Are there any choices you actively engage in that are rotting your foundation in your marriage, in your family, in your relationship with Christ? Is there anything you're dwelling on that's weakening your spiritual capacity? Is it time to reestablish your foundation upon Jesus? After all, Jesus is our foundation and eternal rock. According to 1 Corinthians 3.11, no other foundation will stand. No one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I would be taking part of the very common practice among the almost Christian American church to tell you only what Jesus accomplished and what Jesus accomplished alone and then come to a full stop. We see so many churches cutting themselves off at the knees today, but I want to be a true messenger of God's word. And I do. You also need to know that it's not just what Jesus does, but it's how he works. How Jesus works is not how you do. He's, here's the secret, friends. It takes both knowing what Jesus does and how Jesus does it, to pursue authentic relationship with who Jesus is. How Jesus works is the linchpin. How Jesus works through you is what forms you into a follower of Christ with a devotion stronger than the grave. If you're finite, like all men, the largest obstacle you will ever face as a Christian is the process by which Jesus strips you of your desire for the things of this world so he can then make you usable for his kingdom. The Jesus process demands you give up the things which bring glory to yourself. Those are then washed away and then Jesus can hand you a life that gives a glory to God. So Jesus has a process and that is the biggest obstacle today's Christian faces in an iPhones, iTunes, iPads, I'm first kind of world. Can I give you a verse? All right, Romans 5, 3 through 4 says, But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Joni Erickson Tata is the best example I could give you of how Jesus allows a process of tribulations that require supernatural perseverance to form godly character and ultimately will clothe you in Christ's eternal hope. See, Joni Erickson Tata was a top-level swimmer and an avid horseback rider. At 17 years old, Jesus allowed the process that changed Joni's life forever to begin. As she dove into the pond, Joni landed headfirst on a rock. 
Joni went into the water saying goodbye to one life, and when she came out of the water, she began day one of the rest of her life. The process Jesus allowed took years. And as Joni was wheeled around, she'd continually ask Jesus when he was going to heal her. Joni was desperate. She attended every healing service she could find. And every time she and the others in wheelchairs would be wheeled out of the venue right before the healing part of the service began. Satan began cloaking her in a robe of defeat and she received it. She thought her life was over. How could she ever live a life clothed with purpose for Christ? While able-bodied Joni had always seemed to know what Jesus had accomplished, Joni knew what Jesus could do, but friends, it was not until Joni surrendered her robe of hopeless defeat to Jesus that she was able to form a relationship with Jesus. And when Jesus returned her robe, she was clothed with a life purposed for Christ. Joni Erickson Tata persevered to the point of finding eternal hope through relationship with Jesus Christ. And perhaps this is what Paul really meant when he said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And perhaps that's the problem. Perhaps the problem is that we want to gain Jesus without letting any part of us truly dying off. The problem I see is we're having a whole lot of celebrations at the end of service. Cutting the ribbon and clapping together for the groundbreaking ceremony. And I love it when someone raises their hand and accepts a new life in Jesus, but what I'm not seeing are enough funerals. In fact, I'm not seeing nearly any funerals. And according to Romans 12.1, we need to be having funerals every day. And in some cases, several times a minute, depending on how many intrusive, unwelcome, unbelonging thoughts are being invited into your head day and night. Hallelujah. I would bank my bottom dollar that everyone in this room knows what Jesus did, but I wouldn't bank a nickel that everyone in here knows who Jesus is as they ought to by living in relationship with him. The bottom line reality check is this. If Jesus did all of this, why are you still walking around half alive in Christ and only half dead to sin? Where is your foundation at? For many today, it's one bad day and your foundation sinks in yet again. Which window will wedge itself shut this time? Which door will seal itself off next time? What part of your uh, foundation is being sunk by the pressure of the enemy? So why are so many who earnestly profess the name of Jesus Christ Walking around half alive to Jesus and half dead to sin. I think it's because a lot of us like comfort, power, and control. Can I give you another verse? Turn to Isaiah 47. We're going to read 8 first, 9 second. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Hmm, that's a shaky foundation. That's a sandy thing to say. Verse 9. But these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and widowhood. Because of the multitude of your sorceries, for the great abundance of your enchantments. Who's that sound like? Sounds, amen. 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 This is Babylon. Here we see a country caught up in the pursuit of power and pleasure. Babylon believed in its own greatness and claimed to be the only power on earth. Hashtag America. Who does that remind you of? Everybody that you know. Everybody on TV, every politician. Babylon was neck deep in the delusion that they were completely secure. Babylon's king even called himself God, 
until the true God in Daniel chapter 4, 27 through 28 set them straight. The devil's delusions are always delicious until the bill comes due. And the bill always comes due. This is why so many of us are cloaking ourselves in the shame from the past. Either what you've done or what has been done to you or both. As deep cries out to deep, Oh, my daughter, where has your heart of worship gone? Oh, my son, when will your scars cease to define you? Too many of God's children are cloaked in the past, robed in long-suffering and never moving to nor past what Jesus accomplished. We need all of God's children wrapped up in an abiding and fiery relationship with Jesus and knowing who he is. Real relationship. Real passion. A real love with strength beyond death itself. Amen. Amen. I want you to imagine with me that Jesus is calling you. He is ascended and sitting at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus looks at you with the passion of many waters mightier than thunder, mightier than the breakers of the sea, stares into your eyes and says, it is time, my son. Are you ready, my daughter? Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Jesus is pure. He is true. And he is prepared to seal you unto himself. Are you willing to take off the cloak are you having enough of sealing yourself in old ways? Imagine Jesus continuing, My zeal, my passion, my compassion for you is measured by my immeasurable love. My love is stronger than death. My love has conquered the grave. And as, as Jesus looks at you, you understand that he wants the best for you. You, you comprehend that he wants to protect you, much like a husband wants to protect his household, and, and wants the best for his wife, much like a mother wants the best for her family and is in the mama bear of her children. And this is how Jesus is jealous for you. Jesus wants what's best for you. Jesus is jealous for relationship with you, a jealousy demanding as the grave, and a jealousy as protective as all of eternity for you. For you. Here is the real Jesus question, and I'm closing with this because we're short on time. Will you enter into a real relationship with Jesus? My friends, the minute you walk out of here, the world will try to come against the burning love of Jesus. The world will break open the floodgates of temptations, surround you with sandy shortcuts, flash flood you with false foundations, and the moment, this moment, is over, the devil is going to try and drown out what is happening in your heart right now. Some of you are experiencing the weight of old cloaks that should have been wrung out, washed up, and replaced years ago. And you see it's time to take it off. Some of you know that the devil is going to try and drown you the second you walk out of this sanctuary with the weight of a thousand problems, a flood of nerves, and an endless waves of anxiety. Things that separate your mind and your heart from who Jesus is. All these things desire to drown your foundation of faith in a way that looks like there are things that are more than what you can handle. So many of you have said, Brother Mike, I have tried. I've made this promise a thousand times. And I've never been able to keep it. How can I ever be saved? And so the waters come in. The waters break in. The waters wear you away. And their desire is to paralyze you. And today we're having a funeral. We are having a funeral for old, dingy, smelly, stinky robes 
And we are having a funeral for the cloaks that consume. So let me ask you a simple question. If you are dead to sin and alive in Christ, why are you wearing your old sin? My brothers and my sisters, so many of you, so many of you have taken the weight from this world and you have placed it on your own shoulders. And you have taken that cloak from your own back off and you have bent down and even as the floods have been present in your own life and in the lives of others, you have mopped up the mess that has been left behind. And then you put it back on and you carry the weight of the world and a thousand problems in the lives of yourself and countless others. And that weight and that mess is all around you and you are covered. And that weight begins to crumble your foundation. And that cloak weighs you down and you're wearing it years at a time, some of you for a lifetime. And this dirty robe becomes more a part of your identity than you yourself do. And if that's you today, Jesus wants you to know He's asking if you will exchange robes with him. Hallelujah. Jesus says, you don't have to wear the weight from this world anymore. I have conquered this world. I have overcome this world. I will take the weight of your dirty, stingy robe, and I will take it through a storm it never saw coming. I will take your robe and drown it in a river that flows with my redemptive blood. Come into relationship with me. And I will clothe you with a new robe. I will clothe you with a new purpose. I will clothe you with a new hope. And I will clothe you with a new foundation. I will place in you a new area of calling. I will wrap you in a new destiny. Come on somebody, I will clothe you with power from on high. So when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you will be my witnesses unto the ends of the earth. I will take your robe and make it my robe so that when I put my robe on you, the past that Satan stole from you will be the future I paid for you when I died for you. The mistake that broke you will be the retake I placed before you. The failures that define you will be what redefines and refines my soldiers. And the emptiness that followed you will be my witness to those I place around you so that when you put it back on, you're not taking the weight of a fallen universe into your world, but you're taking the glory of God's eternity and into the foundation of what Jesus is going to build through you. Hallelujah. <clears throat> My friends, that's why many waters cannot quench this love. That's why floods cannot drown this love. That's why torrents of rain can't put out this flame. That's why an everlasting love can't be bought. It can't be sold. It can only be one thing, received. Do you receive it today? Give God the praise if you receive what he has for you today. Is that's apolutrosis. That's the redemption. That's the repurchase. That's the replacement of your robe. That God places a God-sized distance between your rescue and what previously enslaved you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are having a funeral for old robes, old cloaks. And if you like to symbolize that, your heart's desire to begin a relationship with Jesus today, afresh, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And for those of you who raised your hands, or should have, congratulations, you have begun the race. Now I want to offer this to you as a finish line. Worship band, will you please return? And I know we're going over time. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. I want to invite you to come across the finish line. I want you to come up here and be anointed. And you will be anointed as a symbol of putting on the new robe that Jesus has bought for you so that you can take what the enemy meant for evil and use it for God's good. As the worship band begins to play, come up here at this time to symbolize 
a new rope. for you now and kiss your feet and worship I can't resist the love the beauty that I see I fall before
Give them a praise this morning. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for the work of your grace in our lives. We thank you, God, that you are always the God of redemption. You are always the God that no matter how dark the night gets, the sun is going to come up. The clouds can block some of the light, but God, the sun always comes up the next morning. And God, you are the son of God, and your light always rises through the darkness. And God, we give you the praise, we give you the glory for the mercy that you have extended to us even this day. Thank you for this word that's given, but more important, God, thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that we yield to this morning, God. Come into our lives, flood into our hearts, oh God. Fill us to fresh, with fresh hope, God, with fresh vision, with fresh calling, God, with fresh anointing, with a fresh hunger for you, oh God. We thank you and we praise you for this beautiful, beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. So God, we give you the praise. Send us out into that harvest field, Lord, empowered and ready to go. Lord, we don't want hype. We want, we want the reality of who you really are in our lives. Help us, God. Help us, help us. Be our strength. We ask in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Good word. Amen. Many of you will see you Thursday night for the Light for the Lost Banquet, some Wednesday morning for the Bible study. God bless.